A consummate Caribbean professional with proven ability in a body of work surrounding negotiation, trade relations, and other matters related to CARICOM. Upon his return from Grace Kennedy, James Moss Solomon served as its director responsible for corporate affairs. Affectionately called Jimmy, he has contributed much to the development of the Jamaican business community through his membership in the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce, where he served as president as an, and as vice president at the Private Sector Organization of Jamaica and president of the Caribbean Association of Industry and Commerce. Currently, Jimmy is on his second secondment to the Mona School of Business and Management as executive in residence. He also served as chairman of the Scientific Research Council, the Universal Access Fund, and deputy chairman of the University Hospital of the West Indies, and currently the National Youth Service. He also serves on several Grace Kennedy boards, including Grace Kennedy Remittance Service, Guyana. A sportsman extraordinaire, James Moss Solomon represented Jamaica at the Commonwealth Games and the Central America and Caribbean Games in swimming and water polo. Wow. <coughs> he finds time to contribute to the Caribbean music scene by being a band musician for the past 47 years and continues to play with his band called 5050. In 2012, Jimmy was bestowed with a national honor, the James, James Moss Solomon O.D. Jimmy has traversed the land and fished its rivers, sailed the Caribbean Sea, and we are humbled by his honesty, straight talk, and hard work. A true Caribbean businessman and Renaissance man, he has worked with many to help groom those whom he came into contact with. His general business knowledge and his ability to zoom in on what is important are key ingredients in gaining the reputation of being a serious, no-nonsense person. Typical Caribbean, no-nonsense businessman. It is now time for you to meet one of your own, a Caribbean man at heart, our guest speaker, James Moss Solomon. Welcome. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. My brothers and sisters from the Caribbean. It's a dangerous thing when you give out this information to people uh, chat to business out loud. I, I think I'm happy to be here. I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, because this, is, this seems to be the, the center for me as a Jamaican because everybody that comes to see me, we are no longer, we are no longer migrating to the United States of America. Okay? Common word on the road is because you know I'm a downtown man and working downtown. So boy, <laughs> so you're going abroad? You're going to the United States? No, sir. You're going to Brooklyn. You're going to the United States of Brooklyn. <laughs> It's a pleasure for me to be here with so many friends from across the Caribbean and your present home. Before I forget, and then ban me. You're welcome, everybody else. Why? JC, you old boys, don't put up your hand. Thank you, I don't want to leave you out, okay? We're not starting a war with kids. Your presence is a positive statement of your interest in what is happening in our region and our respective homeland. Furthermore, the, the attention that you have all paid to the state of education as an input into the transformation of our people and economies as an essential ingredient for sustainable development in a rapidly changing global environment speaks to an understanding of the dynamics that emerge in the world that we now live in. For those of us at home, the actual experience in the cutting edge world is not a reality that our people fully comprehend and which they are prepared to exploit or effectively participate in. It is an unfortunate situation as most of us in Jamaica and possibly elsewhere in the Caribbean seem to learn by observation rather than by reading books and manuals. Therefore, any restrictions that prevent those of us at home from accessing experiential or tactile learning must be seen as a major challenge to developing the skill sets 
that may be most relevant to personal development and ultimately to sustainable development. So tonight we must challenge ourselves to think beyond the historical experiences of our own home experience only and think about the ways in which the future can be addressed with a mix of the old and the new. In setting those parameters, those of us who now reside outside our home countries have left for a wide variety of reasons over the decades and have taken with us different skills or have developed skills which may have had a negative effect at home. Professor Elizabeth Thomas Hope in her book Caribbean Migration suggests that labor may not be the only commodity to be exchanged in migration except in times of direct recruitment. However, in times of greater freedom, with fewer restrictions of the skills that qualified movement, then in a strict economic analysis, labor is not a servant of capital. In my own simplistic way, our migrants have taken inherent entrepreneurial skills with them that greatly overshadow their pure labor value. In these cases, our home countries are poor by far for having lost you and the ones you were able to develop. I congratulate our nurses here this evening because if we look at it, it's not just the world spoke about 150,000, but let me just tell you, most of the people who left Jamaica had to come here in nursing to be nurse practitioners, as we call them in Jamaica. And these nurses have taken the opportunity here and made themselves into all sorts of things with doctorates of specialty in nursing. And we must be proud of them, but it is a loss for us at home because those skills that they have gained here are lost to us because they came here to do one of the lower level jobs in nursing and have risen right to the top of the profession. And we, let, we have been left behind. But I congratulate them because they set an example that we need to follow. In addition with us, formerly strong family values, structures, businesses, the loss of the spirit of creativity, and a strong analytical focus, largely based on historical experiences and memory retention, have been devastating to continuity at home. It leads to the unnecessary preoccupation with the need to reinvent the wheel simply as a consequence of an almost total loss of intellectual capital retention. This can be readily seen in the event of a hurricane or a similar natural disaster. We easily forget. We rebuild flimsy structures. We build in known riverbeds and gullies, and we fail to take the necessary precautions to protect ourselves even when we should know that our respective governments lack the appropriate response assets. The downside is that we make, make progress at times but the failures to deal with the events have a high probability, those events that have a high probability leave us vulnerable <coughs> to sudden reversals. It's like that old time dance, one step forward, two step back. <laughs> you understand? It's not a three step moving forward. So at home, we are disadvantaged. The downside is that the short term mentality suggested by the regularity of these downsides must question the ability of our educational environment to produce thinking citizens as opposed to people who merely follow paths taken that have quite clearly failed. The loss of people and skills is not limited to business only, but it's more demonstrable in education at all levels. Loss has tended to enable the supremacy of repetition over thought, and therefore innovation has suffered as a direct result. It is a serious disadvantage in a world where intellectual property is in the ascendancy, at least in the relative returns at different levels of the value chain. I think, Doctor, you had shown us that very clearly in the jobs of the future. So let's look at migration at different times briefly. One of the most important points to recognize as our people migrated is the importance of the skills they took with them. 
in the period of the second attempt of building the Panama Canal after the failure in the, 19, in the 1880s by the French, the United States commenced a better engineered solution. This construction called for mechanization, organized workforces, engineers, mechanics, food supplies, record keeping, and accounting. It is therefore important to recognize that West Indians provided segments of the industrial skills and accounting and organizational skills that were developed by the sugar industry over the decades of production after the abolition of slavery. To the extent that these persons did not return, the effect may have been to inhibit industrialization. Similarly, the early recruitment of agricultural scientists to develop production of sugarcane and bananas in Cuba and Central America took away large sections of the persons trained in specific tropical agriculture. The development of the oil industry in Venezuela recruited appropriate skills from Barbados, the Eastern Caribbean, and Ghana. Many persons simply stayed in the host countries and developed business interests outside of the original intent and became partially integrated in those countries. Additionally, children born in the Panama Canal Zone were deemed to be U.S. citizens and some gained unrestrict, unrestricted access to that country, this country here, the state of New York, has been a major beneficiary of this outcome of migration. The migration to Britain in the post-World War II era took labor skills that flourished in the transport sector and trade skills involved in support services required in an economy that was being rebuilt after the ravages of war on human resources and infrastructure. The 1970s movement of people was propelled by differing interpretations of political direction and had a profound and long-lasting effect mainly for Jamaica and Ghana. The sudden removal of large, a large portion of the entrepreneurial persons and the capital flight associated with that movement created a void that has yet to be filled. In Jamaica, this can easily be seen. Driving through downtown Kingston along Spanish Town Road and reading the fading signs of former businesses now shuttered or completely vandalized in many ways. It speaks to an interruption of production and has had an effect from which we have yet to recover. The skills passed on through natural apprenticeship that had been imparted by practical employment has been totally lost and needs to be replaced. This is an education, not area that will require the knowledge and experience of you, the diaspora, as our local ability may be inadequate to address the challenges of a workforce with no idea of the norms and standards of the wider global community. The state of education in the Caribbean is well defined by Professor Errol Miller and so many other academics, and their findings are easily found in his many publications on the internet. They trace long periods and characterize the changes in delivery and objectives of education, but their analyses are much too long for complex and evolve for such a complex and evolving state of affairs for full discussion tonight. Suffice it to say that at this point in time, the delivery is again out of sync with the needs. This is an important consideration for the diaspora, and the inputs are required to put the time frames in such a position as to maximize the efforts and limited resources. The plain fact is that not all development assistance from international donors actually addresses the problems we face in the Caribbean in general, and Jamaica in particular. In many cases, they do not provide solutions for the current situations and therefore are limited in their impact. The need for education should be to impact the society in such a way that will transform their appreciation of options and therefore be able to make meaningful choices for their own future growth and that of the society. I will use Jamaica as an example illustrating little known solutions 
or at least if they are known, they are little discussed publicly. Here are ten. One, in several urban areas, freedom of movement is prevented through actual intimidation or a strong perception of fear. Two, this affects inner cities and also so-called uptown communities. Thirdly, the children of both sides of the spectrum may all go to the same schools, especially high schools. Fourth, the children of the uptown may never know the experience of taking a bus or even know below halfway tree, and the children of the inner cities may never know Hope Gardens, Port Royal, or Ocherness. Fifth, yet at some time during school and after graduation, they may be expected to perform together in unison without having the benefit of understanding the real world. Six, they speak different languages. They have different travel experiences. Some sleep soundly, and some are interrupted by the frequent disturbances of the tenement yard. Seven, in both scenarios, some are neglected and some are abused. Eight, this is a dysfunctional set of events and does and will continue to affect development of individuals and the society. Nine, there are few positive points of interaction and even sporting activities fail to provide an effective basis for interaction between the two extremes. 10. It is a recipe for disaster. Born of a misunderstanding of a small island society and tends to suggest a further source of strife that goes far beyond political tribalism and takes on a life of its own. The current educational focus. In one, there is no defined policy as to where to start, given the lack of sufficient funds to make changes at the infant, primary, secondary, tertiary, and technical skill level all at the same time. We do not have the luxury <coughs> of the cash to care. That's a reality. There is a difficult political challenge in choosing one or two areas, as there will be fallout from those in the areas not chosen. So you can imagine a government saying, we're going to start with infant education, because that's what we have the funds to do. And then you hear, what about my child in primary? What about free education at secondary, and free education at tertiary, and don't you see? Trinidad does it, and want to see this one does it, and you understand the political difficulty that is there. There's no easy solution. The new buzzword is STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths. Nothing is wrong with that, except how do we teach STEM effectively in an environment where the effective command of English is not consistent within the school communities at any level, in either read, spoken, or written format. This challenge that I'm making is not out of respect for our own beautiful and descriptive language, but to recognize that it has not evolved to describing complex scientific <coughs> concepts and data effectively. No, if you were to offer me some of a little white rum to put in my coconut water. I could tell you some big joke in a Jamaican. Oh, I will make you bust aside in here anyway. You will not get asthma by the time you go back outside. But that ability of mine in fluent Jamaican, I've asked these challenges through, through no, no worldwide since I'm in the world center of Brooklyn. But I'm asking somebody if you either speak Jamaican, or you speak a French Creole, right? Or French from St. Lucia, right? 
explain Pythagoras theorem to me in Paco. <laughs> Challenge has been out there a year, I think Mr. Webb is soon, we soon have to put it on like something where you pay and enter and withdraw the answer like the lottery. Right? But honestly, it is the proverbial thing in the same America, the $64,000 question. How do you explain scientific concepts in a language that has not evolved scientifically? It's descriptive for plays, writing music, other things, poetry, rendition even. I could entertain you here for an hour in battle. But it does not help me to explain nuclear physics. And we need to stop and understand it. So anybody who keeps on telling you that we're going to start to teach Patwa in Jamaican schools, I'm asking you, please tell them, pull up your like the policeman and say, stop. Because none of the jobs that were put up there earlier, that are the cutting edge jobs, lend itself to an explanation in Patwa. phenomena of not being able to instigate violent confrontation in English needs great consideration from you. Primary school, secondary school, and tertiary school and my friends up at university, we can't pick a fight in English. We cannot pick a fight. At I have girls and boys that teach at the Grace Kennedy Homework Center on Tower Street. I have girls and boys that are fourth formers. You know, that's the trouble some here. Right? They are 15 years old. And they give a lot of trouble. I used to give a lot of trouble when I oh, that's still give trouble. <laughs> Tell me not, don't, don't look at me like that. I will confess. I will confess on my own. Don't read the finger. I am confessing. All right. So, the question is, like, you know, the boys and girls sit down in the class. Boys and the boys, a nice looking lady is there, so he'll take his pen out of his pocket. <laughs> now, if she says to him, Jimmy, stop sticking me with your pen. <laughs> I don't like it. Yeah. Argument finished. Done. Yes. But if she turned to me and said, you know, good language, said, why are you looking for Dutch wife? <laughs> I have a different outcome. And I'm just saying to all of you, I don't know how everybody's language has spread, but for you Jamaicans in here, practice it. Try to pick a fight in it properly. Okay? And you'll find out that it's doing something. And it's something that we consider because it is what leads to a fight in a bar. It is what leads to deterioration of attitude between people. It caused a war in the tenement yard. It caused a stabbing. It caused a shooting. And you, the diaspora, whose voices are heard in this center of population called Brooklyn, which is the center of the earth, for those of us at home, need to help put that fire out by insisting that this is the So I'm finally suggesting that we put in the STEM situation a E, that E is for English. And we can produce either a STEM, which sounds like a Spanish word to me, but maybe we could produce a STEM to suggest something uplifting. Embracing science, technology, engineering, English, mathematics for a more comprehensive and widespread goal that can address all stages of education and lift the esteem of those students that we're trying to help. Yes. So how can you help? The important thing is how can you help? You in the diaspora, it's not all about money. Okay? Yes. We love you to send some money. Quite nice. I have a light bill to pay, so I have a cousin in the audience. I don't give them a Western But one of the things is that you can help, and what you have here is worth more, even more, than the money that you send. I think I'm asking you to deal with the discussion on the effective ways to bring English up to the highest standards 
it used to be a competitive advantage. I went to school 1970 at McMaster University in Canada. And if I have an essay or a term paper to write, I know I'm coming in the first 2%. Yes, right. Give me back this multiple choice thing, boy, I don't need the bottom of it. Okay. You all know the ways that the school system here has to deal with so many different nationalities who may not speak English at home. So you are getting a practical experience now in the United States that we don't have. Yeah, we have it at home because hardly anybody speaking English at home. But then you have many varieties, which you know, Spanish, French, all sorts of languages. You know, Russian, all sorts of people, German, and they don't speak it English at home, but you're finding a way to educate them in English. And I'm asking for your help. Secondly, I want you to research ways that experiential learning can be delivered effectively, even though travel may be restricted. Create classrooms that come alive in ways that will make our children want to go to school. Provide the elements and sources of learning for use on projectors, audio, interactive whiteboards, and visual aids. Our children need to see things they don't get to travel out. They can't go more than 500 yards that way because of political borders and gang borders. And help them realize it. Let's not push it under the carpet that these things are happening. Okay? But we need your help. Bring the easy starter kits for robotics, those new Lego things that they have in there, and science to our classrooms. Be agents for transformation. This costs money, probably a lot. So continue your outstanding contributions to your schools of choice and insist on and monitor their effective usage. Okay? Don't just give a computer to your old primary school and figure that you won't use it for the right thing. If you have enough, to give and you bring it down there, then see that they're using it properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one of the greatest things that this diaspora can do. Right. Go beyond sports and include creative industries and critical thinking. Yes. <laughs> Not 2.3 million people, 2.7 million people can't be your same boat. So some, we have to create some opportunity for the others. Teach us how to integrate cultural difficulties into manageable societies where all can exist peacefully. I notice people come in here, they dress how they want to dress, and nobody say, boy, Miss Yuna, you are the JLP, and I am the PNP, because my shirt is this one. You learn something better than that in America. So try and teach us to. Teach us the strategic value of invention, innovation, and protecting intellectual property. Use your influence on corporate foundations in the USA and engage them with your projects or assist programs of corporate foundations in Jamaica that are well managed. I'll give you a quick story. Western Union Foundation, Grace Kennedy, and the Grace and Staff Community Development, and USAID partner. Western Union, Western Union gave us um, computers to set up the computer labs in our five homework centers. USAID has come forward giving us 450,000 US dollars. We could be in everything. We are now coming up with a STEM center. We have the money to do it. And it is a cooperation between the USAID, who don't usually work with private foundations, either in the US or in Jamaica. But they have worked with Western Union Foundation Grace and, Grace and Staff Community Development Foundation and put together something that is benefiting those 400 children that Mr. Webby spoke about. Mm -hmm. Continue to care for your families at home and continue to be in touch with them and offer whatever help you can in your usual generous way. Finally, I urge you to help us to maintain the values and positive behaviors that are so important for the continued mystique that we can only describe as Brand Jamaica. I don't quite know myself what it means, but it is a mystique out there that still has a positive value. It is not 
Jamaica, the murder capital of the world. It is Jamaica. You see in both Bob Marley, this and that, Shelley and Fraser, Price. This is what the image still is out there. We are not doing everything we can to burn the ship at home. So help us, it needs little brasso. <laughs> <laughs> the positive image is perhaps the most important factor that you can keep safe and untarnished for those of us at home who really need to follow the principles of what makes us West Indian, Caribbean people, perhaps the most successful and prominent immigrant groups across the face of North America. We in home are proud of you. You hold our future reputation of honest, honesty, our culture, and our value in your hands. We have removed it from the country for safekeeping. Help us to return it. Help us to once again be as proud of ourselves as you are of us. Thank you.